Brilliant. Thank you. So Thank without you. further ado. Thank you. Is everything okay with the screen? Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Is that working? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, hi. So, my uh, talk is entitled Truth is No Apollo Belvedere, No Formal Thing, Queering a Queer Icon, Reappropriating Apollo. Um, this Marianne Moore quote that I've taken to entitle the presentation, uh, I think, offers us some interesting ways of thinking about how we perceive classical statues and classical images um, to be to be kind of fixed and then in turn ways that we can kind of query these and, and think about them in different ways. Um, so I am focusing on the statue of the Apollo Belvedere um, uh, one of the most widespread images of classical sculpture in the Western canon. Uh, this depiction, which is also known as the Pythian Apollo, represents the god just after he's killed the Pythian serpent. Um, it was rediscovered during the Italian Renaissance, and it's been part of the Vatican collection ever since, excluding a brief period when um, the statue was housed in the Louvre after it had been captured by Napoleon and paraded into Paris in triumphal procession, along with other prized pieces from antiquity. The Apollo Belvedere was returned to Rome in 1815, and it has remained there ever since. Um, looking at the 18th century and going into the 19th century, we see that the potential audience for spectators of, um, of classical statues, and in particular the Apollo Belvedere, was not limited to those people who could, who could travel to Rome and see the original statue. Through the... Um, kind of more widespread um, use of printed images, engravings, and descriptions of artworks found in travel guides, as well as cast copies and increased access to museums and private collections. In the 18th century, the Apollo Belvedere became a statue whose image reached widespread circulation and recognition. Um, in the examples shown here, we see um, that the Apollo Belvedere formed part of the initial um, collection of casts in the Royal Academy in London, where it was used um, as, as an artist's model. And it also formed the core collection of John Soane's Museum, which was one of the first house museums to open to the public in 1813. The Apollo Belvedere was by no means the only statue with this kind of widespread visibility and circulation, but the history of its image is made more interesting and also more complicated by the intersection of its queer reception with the colonial rep reception as well. Arguably, the Apollo um, Apollo has always been a queer figure um, ever since classical literature, but it's significant that in the 18th century, when new ways of thinking about the history of art and the classification of art objects came into focus, new interpretations of the Apollo Belvedere surface as well. In particular, the Apollo Belvedere was singled out by the so-called founding father of art history, Winkelmann. Um, where he described this statue as sublimely superhuman, full of grandeur, um, you know, he had graceful youthfulness, um, soft tenderness on the proud build of his limbs. Winkelmann called him the highest ideal of art among the works of antiquity that have escaped its destruction. Um, but it wasn't only Winkelmann who praised the physique of the, Apollo, of the Apollo Belvedere. Many travel writers also singled out the Apollo as a particularly beautiful statue. For example, the writer Anna Riggs Miller, who wrote in 1776 that the muscles of the Farnese Hercules are like craggy rocks compared to the beauty of the Belvederean Apollo. The, Bel the Apollo Belvedere then was figured as an object that both men and women could find, attractive, could find attraction to, 
Um, and it was the queer aesthetics of this beauty that made it particularly um, enticing for those viewing it. The, um, so these kind of idealized aesthetics of beauty um, made the statue a uniquely attractive object for artists to study from. One of the earliest examples of the statue being used in this way was its inclusion in the 17th century volume, The Proportions of the Human Body, measured from the most beautiful figures of antiquity by Gerard Audran. Um, Audran included um, a statue of the Apollo Belvedere, as seen here, with precise measurements delineated, um, covering every inch of the Apollo's body. Um, he also singled out the Apollo for special treatment in focusing on certain um, facial features. Um, so in this particular volume, it's not every statue that is uh, that includes dimensions of, of the face, as you can see here. Um, as time went on, the Apollo continued to be an important, an important figure as an artistic model from the 18th century into the 19th century. So here we have going from left to right sketches of the Apollo Belvedere by Millet and Turner and Angelica Kaufman. However, the idealized aesthetics of the Apollo Belvedere's beauty also made the statue uniquely susceptible to more dangerous ideological treatment as we shall see next. And just to warn you here um, in the next slide, I'll be um, talking about um, these kind of phrenological elements, but these will be uh, contained to one slide. Um, as the desire for precise classification of artworks grew in the 18th century, so too did an interest in classifying humans. Um, three of the earliest texts that set out guidelines for physiognomic studies, those by Camper, Vire, and Knott and Glidden, did so with explicit reference to ancient sculpture. Angela Saini has talked about um, the fact that in these texts, the typical Euro European face was artfully modeled on classical sculpture, while um, those of African faces were, cr were crude cartoons with exaggerated features. The, the text by Vire, initially uh, used the head of a statue of Zeus as the model for that of an ideal human. But by the publication of Camper's text in 1792, we see that, the, that these texts have shifted to using the head of the Apollo Belvedere as the model. As Kirk Savage says in his study, the shift to the Apollo subtly and effectively shifted the axis of, of comparison from brute power, which it was when they used statues of Zeus, to more specifically aesthetic and intellectual qualities. The importance of the aesthetic dimension to racial theory cannot be overemphasized, and sculpture served as the aesthetic standard. So we see here that there is a very explicit comparison between the head of the Apollo Belvedere um and those of other humans um in this case the apollo belvedere being used to literally set the dimensions for how an ideal european human head should appear so while Seni used the generously broad term classical sculpture to talk about the way in which these images were used for our purposes i think it's important to acknowledge that this it was not necessarily a broad allusion to Greco-Roman imagery. It was a very explicit um, comparison to the Apollo Belvedere. The careful studiousness of Gerard Audran's measurements of classical sculpture begin to look very different in the light of the physiognomic illustrations that we later see used to prop up racist ideology. It makes an uncomfortable relationship when we see that the, the idealized aesthetic beauty of the Apollo Belvedere, in some ways the very thing that links the statue to queer history and queer reception in the first place, allows it to sit comfortably alongside racist pseudoscience. However, I would like to concentrate now on three different images um, that use aspects of the Apollo 
from across the long 19th century to reconsider the ways in which the Apollo image was being queried and examined. Um, all of these pieces were created by women neoclassical sculpt sculptors, and in each piece I will talk about different aspects of the figure of Apollo are teased out and um, I think what really comes across is a mature and considered understanding of the statue, its history and its complexity. Um, while these images cannot dilute the disturbing legacy of the Apollo's connection to phrenological texts, they will, I hope, give us new ways to think about um, to think about the ways in which the troubling use of this image was being pushed back against. So the first sculptor I want to talk about is Anne Seymour Dahmer. Um, she was a neoclassical sculptor based in London and widely regarded as one of the first widely celebrated women artists to work in that medium. Sculpture, due to the physicality of the work, was often seen as a medium better suited for men. Dammer started her career as a portrait artist, again, a career path that was seen as more, um, more respectable and appropriate for a woman to practice in. Although, incidentally, she also liked to sculpt people's pets. Many of the subjects that she depicted were women who were um, respected individuals in their own right, and several of them also happened to be her lovers, including Mary Berry, who is pictured here. Um, however, she soon began moving on to more ambitious projects, for example, um, taking commissions to design relief sculptures for London bridges, as pictured here, and um, the Boydell Shakespeare Gallery beginning to verge on territory more uh, traditionally considered to be better suited for men. Um, numerous contemporaries who mentioned Dahmer in their writings frequently described her as an intelligent, well-educated woman who was teaching herself Latin and Greek, and she spent a lot of time in Rome with kind of artist expat colonies as well. Um, furthermore, she her sister was married to the third Duke of Richmond, who had an extensive cast gallery in his own um, in in his residence at Whitehall. And the image of Apollo shown here is a copy of one of those copies. In 1789, Dahmer accepted a commission to design a piece for the facade of the Drury Lane Theatre, and it's at that point that uh, she starts to run into problems for. Um, so we know that she sculpted an Apollo Belvedere to, um, to, to go on the facade of the theatre, but unfortunately we don't have that sculpture remaining because the entire Drury Lane Theatre building was demolished in 1791. However, we do have this satirical print by William Holland, which shows Dahmer in her studio um, sculpting the very Apollo that was going to go on the Drury Lane facade. Um, and I think this print can tell us a number of interesting things about public opinion of Dahmer and the Apollo Belvedere and um, their kind of queer partnership. So on the one hand, we have an Apollo with a very kind of effete appearance, a suggestively placed spear and Dahmer's chisel placed right on the statue's buttocks. Um, which are all, I think, kind of suggesting to us the homoerotic qualities of the sculpture. Um, meanwhile, we have Dahmer, who was a relatively open lesbian, um, and her kind of the heavy handed way in which she's chiseling at this statue um, is kind of, I think, putting gender and sexuality at the forefront of Holland's understanding of both the Apollo Belvedere and Dahmer's relationship to the Apollo statue. Um, we can only kind of wonder at what kind of sculpture Dahmer did create. Unfortunately, we don't have a copy of it. Uh, secondly, I'll, we, I'll look at um, the work of Harriet Hosmer. Harriet Hosmer was um, an American sculptor considered to be the US's first very successful um, woman sculptor. And like Dahmer, she spent a lot of time in Rome working um, among expat artist communities there. So, like Dahmer. Oh, so sorry, Ema. Um, some of the images, uh, I think we're struggling to, to see a little bit. Maybe it's a question of them loading slowly or 
maybe afterwards we can they could be converted to a PDF and shared. Um, oh, okay, sure. Um, can you see can you see any of them? We can see some of them, but they're kind of come up intermittently. So at the moment on the slide, we can't see an image. Um, oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry about that. No, it no might be, <laughs> might be my internet connection. Okay, yeah, they might just be loading slowly. No worries. Um, okay, I'll bear that in mind. Um, so as, um, like Dahmer was, um, Hosmer was also associated strongly with using women as the subjects for her artworks. So we can see here another satirical sketch, which shows the Prince of Wales visiting Hosmer's studio, um, in which these kinds of um, canonical classical looking images um, are represented as, as, as all women. Um, and furthermore, Hosmer also had an interest in rehabilitating characters from classical mythology. Um, we might think it's a modern movement to reclaim Medusa as a rape victim rather than a mere irredeemable monster. But um, as far back as 1854, Hosmer was playing with the same kind of idea with her statue of Medusa on the right. Um, What's interesting to consider in this vein is Hosmer's bust image of Daphne, um, which I hope you can see. Um, so in contrast to other artists, um, most famously Bernini, who chose to focus on the moment that Apollo grabbed Daphne in the Daphne and Apollo story, Dahmer has, uh, Hosmer has chosen to represent Daphne here on her own. Here, Daphne is a serene figure whose metamorphosis is figured as a moment of calm and perhaps even respite. It's only the garland of leaves um, that kind of hang around her breasts that signal to us any metamorphosis is about to occur. Um, in this way, we might think of Hosmer as performing her own form of um, cancel culture on Apollo um, by um, kind of exiting him from the artwork completely. Um, his presence is merely slightly alluded to. Daphne is reclaimed here as the protagonist of the episode. However, I think we might also look here at alternative images of Apollo, not just the Apollo, not just the Apollo Belvedere. Um, for example, the Apollo um, Cithorodus, which is in the Montemartini Museum, also in Rome, figure it uh, portrays Apollo as a very gender fluid figure and we can maybe think perhaps about how these gender fluid images of Apollo are being alluded to in Hosmer's representation of Daphne um, as well as the fact that the curls at the front of Daphne's hair are um, perhaps in some ways evoking the curls of the Apollo Belvedere. Um, she is perhaps trying to remind us that no one image of Apollo should take precedence in the canon. Finally, um, I'm going to look at um, our chronologically latest artist, Edmonia Lewis. Um, Lewis is often praised as the first professional African-American sculptor um, to have practiced. She was born in Ohio or New York around 1843 and studied fine art at Oberlin College, uh, although she wasn't permitted to graduate. Um, she, uh, she managed to make money by, from commissions of portrait busts from abolitionist members of the military during the Civil War, and this provided her with enough funds to travel to Rome, where she settled and actually worked alongside Hosmer, who particularly took her under her wing. Um, again, I hope you can see these images. Um, she was Edmonia Lewis was intensely interested in the neoclassical style, um, and she, she liked to use Greco-Roman subject matter. So we see here she has, statu she has statues of the young Octavian and also the dying Cleopatra, which was a controversial statue in its day. But she was also interested in portraying um, First Nations characters in the same neoclassical style as her figures from Greco-Roman antiquity. The piece pictured here, Old Arrow Maker, illustrates an excerpt from the Song of Hiawatha by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Um, and she might have chosen this particular story as Hiawatha in the story was from the same tribe that her mother had been from. Lewis 
also looked to biblical imagery as a as a um, source of inspiration and she uh, used the figure of Hagar um, as the subject for one of her most popular sculptures. Um, in, in the biblical story, Hagar was the mother of Abraham's son Ishmael. And she was enslaved and forced to bear a child on behalf of Sarah, who was Abraham's childless wife. It's the story that inspires the regime of Gilead in The Handmaid's Tale. Unlike other treatments of this scene, however, Lewis depicts Hagar alone without her infant son. And um, there's a real sense of optimism and resolve in her clasped hands and the forward movement that she's making. To depict an enslaved woman of colour in the high aesthetics of neoclassicism has been interpreted by many as a triumphant move, though others have considered it more a reflection of the whitewashing necessary in the day um, to allow for the depiction of non-white subjects. In his study of Winkelmann's aesthetics, Alex Potts in Flesh and the Ideal suggests that the eroticized reading of the Apollo Belvedere statue rests on the fact that the Apollo that Apollo has just killed the Python. He is therefore a heroic figure imbued with masculine energy and less dangerously homoerotic. The Apollo was prevented, therefore, from being a passive recipient of the desirous queer gaze. In this vein, we might consider um, the action that's inherent in the Apollo Belvedere's movements and look at the Hagar, um, look at Lewis's Hagar in a different light. Um, I think there's certainly um, certain similarities between the contrapposto stance and the sense of forward movement in the visual vocabulary of each statue. That these illusions seem very deliberate in accordance with Lewis's program of adopting neoclassical language and aesthetics for her subjects. Um, and I think in this case, the illusion is particularly powerful in light of the dependence of um, race science on the, on the physiology of the Apollo Belvedere. To conclude, um, neoclassicism as a movement is often associated with privileging ideal, idealized versions of aesthetic beauty, and in particular, materializing an idea of whiteness and purity. While this is certainly a play in many images from this time period, we can also look to um, these kinds of images, putting them in conversation with each other to see how the formal language of neoclassicism is being used to problematize aspects of the classical canon as well as imbue this criticism with a sense of visual legitimacy. These three examples by no means rescue the Apollo Belvedere from its deeply troubling history of being used in race science, but in utilizing the queer characteristics of these, sculpture, of these sculptures, the artists were able to find a language to express new ideas about the classical canon. And for our purposes, I hope that putting these images side by side can help us find new ways about thinking of the queer histories of objects and images and how we can um, sort of use these going forward. Thank you.